I do know a lot of those similarities. I know Kennedy was assassinated and Johnson became president. Lincoln was assassinated. Johnson became president. Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln. Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy. There was a lot of these similarities. They were both with their wives at the time. Welcome to Talk With History. I'm your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. On this podcast, we give you insights to our history-inspired world travels, YouTube channel journey, and examine history through deeper conversations with the curious, the explorers, and the history lovers out there. Booth's day began in the dining room of the National where he was seen eating breakfast with Miss Carrie Bean. Nothing unusual about that. Booth, a voluptuous connoisseur of young women, never had trouble finding female company. Around noon, he walked over to Ford's Theater on 10th Street between E and F, a block above Pennsylvania Avenue to pick up his mail. Accepting correspondence on behalf of itinerant actors was a customary privilege Ford's offered to friends of the house. Earlier that morning, Henry Clay Ford, one of the three brothers who ran the theater, ate breakfast and then walked to the big marble post office at 7th and F and picked up the mail. There was a letter for Booth. That morning, another letter arrived at the theater. There had been no time to mail it, so its sender, Mary Lincoln, used the president's messenger to bypass the post office and hand deliver it. The Fords did not even have to read the note to know the good news it contained. The mere arrival of the White House messenger told them that the president was coming tonight. It was a coup against their chief rival, Grover's Theater, which was offering a more exciting entertainment, Aladdin or his wonderful lamp. Master Tad Lincoln and his chaperone would represent the family there. The letter, once opened, announced even greater news. Yes, the president and Mrs. Lincoln would attend this evening's performance of Tom Taylor's popular, if tired comedy, Our American Cousin. But the big news was that General Ulysses S. Grant was coming with them. The Lincoln's timing delighted the Fords. Good Friday was traditionally a slow night, and news that not only the president, after four years, a familiar sight to Washingtonians, but also General Grant, a rare visitor to town, and fresh from his victory at Appomattox, would attend, was sure to spur ticket sales. This would please Laura Keene, who was making her 1,000th performance in the play. Tonight's show was a customary benefit, awarding her a rich share of the proceeds. The Lincolns had given the Fords the courtesy of notification early enough in the day for the brothers to promote their appearance and to decorate and join together the two boxes, seven and eight. That, by removal of a simple partition, formed the president's box. By the time Booth arrived at Ford's, the president's messenger had come and gone. Sometime between noon and 12.30 p.m., as he sat outside on the top step in front of the main entrance to Ford's reading his letter, Booth heard the galvanizing news. In just eight hours, the subject of all his brooding, hating, and plotting would stand on the very stone steps where he now sat. This was the catalyst Booth needed to prompt him to action. Here, of all places, Lincoln was coming here. Booth knew the layout of Ford's intimately, the exact spot on 10th Street where Lincoln would step out of his carriage, the place the president sat every time he came to the theater, the route through the theater that Lincoln would walk and the staircase he would ascend to the box, the dark subterranean passageway beneath the stage, the narrow hallway behind the stage that led to the back door that opened Baptist Alley, and how the president's box hung directly above the stage. All right, Jen, we, just for folks who don't know, we just moved and we are recording in our new, we're calling it our studio. Yes. So we just moved from Virginia to Tennessee. We are living in the greater Memphis area now, and we're pretty excited to record this particular episode in our brand new studio. Yeah, it's kind of fitting to be here and recording this episode, especially since we made this video like the week the Packers came. That's right. It was so important for us to make this video because 
to to realize how important this person was and so close to where we lived in Virginia to visit their grave before we moved all the way to Tennessee. Yeah. It was important to get this video done. Yeah. Now that intro that I gave earlier was an excerpt from the 2007 book Manhunt, The 12 Day Chase for Lincoln's Killer by author James L. Swanson. But before we dive into the video and the topic, I want to say a thank you to Bill Sisser, who wrote in, he shot us an email and he wrote, I've recently come across your podcast channel and after listening to the first few episodes, I came across the one on the Lincoln assassination. Mm. It reminded me of a book that I read in high school around 80 or 81 that compared the Lincoln and Kennedy assassinations. I looked through the list of your podcasts. I don't think I saw one with that subject. Reading that book started my interest in history and reading also. I hope that you could look at all the similarities between the two stories and do an in-depth podcast on them. I enjoy your in-depth podcasts and will continue to listen. Thank you, Bill. Now, I just thought that was an interesting thing, and I didn't know if you had ever heard of books of kind of comparing assassinations like that. So it's interesting you say that. As we were driving out to Tennessee, we stopped at your dad's. He's about halfway. Yeah, outside of Nashville. Outside of Nashville, and we went thrifting. And as we were thrifting, I found a picture that someone had made. It was their own, but they had compared the Lincoln assassination with the Kennedy assassination. And they had put the two comparisons side by side. And then they put like a dollar bill, or I think they put like a Kennedy dollar and a a Lincoln penny. Yeah. And I, I, I do know a lot of those similarities. I know Kennedy was assassinated and Johnson became president. Lincoln was assassinated. Johnson became president. Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln. Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy. There was a lot of these similarities. They were both with their wives at the time. They're both shot in the head. There was a lot of these similarities. I have heard that. The reason why we haven't done this, Bill, is because most of our podcasts coincide with a video. And because of that, we haven't covered the Kennedy assassination. We haven't been to Dallas yet. However, now that we're closer to Dallas, that is a plan to get out there. I do want to cover the Kennedy assassination. It'll probably be more than one video. That time and place in history is still so controversial. We know the papers still haven't all been released yet. More information is coming out daily. They keep saying they're going to declassify stuff and they don't. And they don't. Because I really feel like there's more to that story that people don't want out yet. Yeah, I had covered something in our newsletter, historynewsletter.com, if you're Mm -hmm. listening, that some recently, within the past year or two, some Secret Service agent had kind of come out with some... I don't know if it's new information or a different take or a different story or something like that. So I just thought it was an interesting email from Bill and seeing as how he wrote it and we were about to record this podcast, I thought it was kind of perfect timing. Well, it's interesting what gets people interested in history. And that is one of those things. People are very, they like to see those coincidences or those things that coincide between, I mean, there's only been four presidents who've been assassinated. And so two of our biggest ones, Kennedy and Lincoln, and how much they coincide with each other, it gets you interested in history. And we're going to talk more about that because the series Manhunt has come out and gets people interested in history. However, there comes an issue sometimes when you're not portraying the correct history. So people think that's the accurate history. I always stress, read the real book, look up the real research, because even Hollywood likes to change things for dramatization and for time constraints and things along that nature. But Yes, whatever gets you interested in history. And one of those, that Lincoln Kennedy association is one of those big things. And I remember learning about it too as a young kid. And it's just funny that I saw that picture as we were thrifting. Yeah. So again, thank you, Bill, to writing in. If anybody else wants to reach out to us, there is a link to our email in the show notes. You can just click on it on your phone and you can shoot us an email. So, Jen, we made a video from Portsmouth, which is just outside, just across a bridge from the Norfolk area. And we went to, was it Oak Grove Cemetery? Cedar Grove. Cedar Grove Cemetery Mm -hmm. to visit someone who was kind of a part of this whole 12-day manhunt for John Wilkes Booth, but the very end. So we visited a garret. So which garret did we visit? We visited Richard Bynum Garrett. So the one of the boys of Richard Henry Garrett. He's like 11. He's 11 years old at the time. And if you read Manhunt, 
he's he's in the book because yeah. he interacts with John Wilkes Booth. And there's like kind of a rec- there is kind of a almost a transcript of his recounting so his, late, his memories yes. of those days. So we will talk more about that later in life. He tries to clear his family name and really give an a accurate account of what he remembers as 11 year old what transpired in those last two days. So it's the last two days, April 24th through the 26th. So remember, it is a 12-day manhunt for John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth is trying to make it to Richmond, Virginia. He believes if he can get to Richmond, Virginia, he will be put into an underground network and saved. And honestly, that's probably true. Because when you think about how John Surratt got away through Canada, how he got into an underground network and got away. I bet if John Wilkes Booth would have made it to Richmond, he would have gotten into some underground network and gotten to Texas, to to Mexico. and But they just can't seem to... John Wilkes Booth is held up because of his injury. They're not the best navigators. They don't really have... This wasn't planned out with the logistics of care. It's mostly like just trying to find sympathizers who help them along the way. Well, and I think even we put in the video, I had pulled a timeline off of a, a website. I think it was like halfway through this 12 days, they end up like crossing a river going in the in the wrong direction. Oh yeah, they go back. So they try to cross from Maryland to Virginia and they go back to Maryland and then they realize their mistake and then, then they make it across to Virginia. So yeah, it's a lot of that. Like the... That is kind of shows you, it, in my opinion, that this really wasn't planned out. Yeah, not to the extent yes. that some people may think. Yes, yeah. that it really was a kidnapping plot at first. That would that is what was planned out, and then when it moved to this assassination plot, which was pretty fast, uh, there was nothing on the back end to really to besides the the field glasses and rifles that go to the Surat Tavern, there really isn't anything planned out along the way. So even Dr. Mudd is not expecting them. He knows them. He's not expecting them. Now he, he's, he willingly helps, helps them, yeah. but it wasn't like it was planned. We're going to go to Dr. Mudd's house. It just happens that B- Booth broke his leg and knew a doctor. Yeah, so Dr. Mudd was kind of interact with him. They saw him early, like mm-hmm. within the first day or two yeah. of the manhunt. And then the Garretts, he, they're kind of getting lost trying to get down to, to Richmond. That's their big goal. And they end up at the Garrett farm. So they meet a Confederate soldier, Willie Jett. Okay. And Willie Jett is from the area. And, he's, and they confess to him that they are the Lincoln assassinate. He's the Lincoln assassin and his kind of accomplice yeah yeah he's helping them escape and so jet and some other confederate soldiers although they're they're wanting to just end the war and and just form back into the union and just find their peace they do feel some kind of obligation because this person has done something so egregious in the name of the south and they've been fighting for the south so they feel like they owe him protection in some degree so Jet knows the Garrett family, knows the farm, and so he brings them there. And the John Wilkes Booth and, and Harold have a disguise that they were also Confederate soldiers, and they they he uses the last name Boyd instead of Booth, J W Boyd. Because yeah, you say because he has has that tattoo on his hand. On his hand. Yeah. Now, in the miniseries Manhunt, which is not accurate at this point, they're wearing. Confederate soldier uniforms? That's not true. Booth Booth and Harold never get Confederate soldier uniforms. They claim to be Confederate soldiers, but not in uniform. Jet is in uniform. And when Jet introduces him to the Garrett family, he's he lives close by. He says, don't you remember me, Mr. Garrett? I'm from this family and I'm heading back home. And these are friends of mine who need some respite and they're going to be heading further south. So that's kind of, that was how Booth and Harold, David Harold, who's with Booth, that's how they were able to kind of stay at the Garrett farm yes. without the Garretts knowing them at all. At all. And the Garretts welcomed okay. them, right? Because Mr. Garrett, Richard Garrett has two sons who just fought for the Confederates. Well, and also, too, if you think about it, it may, that makes a lot more sense to me that they welcome in these strangers mm-hmm. 
One, because his sons just got back from fighting on the Confederate side. But two, if you've got a neighbor saying, these are my friends, they need help. You can, when you have someone vouching for someone else, that goes a long way. And that was very much how business was transacted in that time. Because it was very much, you couldn't trust people, but you could trust people who knew you. And if they were willing to vouch, it made you more at peace with with helping other people. So that's exactly why the Garretts allow Booth and Harold to stay in their house. Okay. And so Richard Garrett, Richard B. Garrett. So I'm going to say Richard H. Garrett, who's the father, and Richard B. Garrett is the grave we visited. That's the son. The son. He's 11 years old at the time. So he has two older brothers, John and William, who have fought for the Confederacy. They just got back from Appomattox. They, when Booth comes to the house with Jet and Harold, it's about three o'clock on April 24th. And introduced to Richard H. Garrett, he says, yes, they can come stay with me. We, they can have, come have dinner. They come and relax. And then the two boys, John and William, return that evening from visiting a friend nearby, right? So they just got back from the war. Yeah, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to see people. They're settling back in. Yeah, they haven't seen it. And they're wearing their Confederate uniforms because they just got back from the surrender of Appomattox. And so they all sit around the dinner table that night. And this is a big family. Now, again, this is not shown in Manhunt at all, but there's four sisters, there's a governess, there's little children. Richard's 11, Richard B. Garrett, but he also has three little sisters. Oh, wow. So there's, it's a, it's a whole like probably 10 to 12 people. 10 to 12 people. And so it's a, it's a boisterous conversation. They're talking about the war. They're talking about their experiences. They're asking Booth about his experiences with the war, thinking he's Boyd who has fought in the war. So Booth is making up stories, but he is an actor. Sure. So he's very good at taking the stage and telling a story telling a story and so it was a really great evening that's how Richard remembers it that everyone just had a really great night and Booth stays in the house they help him into bed right he gets a good night's sleep and Richard B. Garrett shares a room with him so he just remembers feeling safe with this guy he's been welcomed into the family He remembers seeing the gun belt on the bed. This is Junior. Yes. Yeah, the 11-year-old. And he, the next morning, so April 25th, he helps him dress in the morning, and they go outside and they have breakfast. And it's, as Booth is playing outside with the other children, remember, there's little children, little girls. I mean, he really loved playing with these kids out in the yard. Yeah, and you even, I think you had mentioned it, in the video like he had a compass he had a magnetic compass so he was like showing the kids how kind of how it worked and kind of showing them oh hey you know if you bring something metal close by it'll move and that was kind of something that was called out and what's so significant is that compass is in the museum at ford's theater because that's the compass booth uses to go the wrong way on the river and and basically escape but this is the scene Right. So you can understand how it, later in life, when Richard is trying to talk about their his experience with this family, how the Garrett's feel bamboozled. Right. So it's later. I think that evening they have some conversation around the assassination of the president, because at that time it's been 10 days. And so it, the word's getting out. The word's getting out. And so John and William are talking about it at, around the dinner table and they're like they're offering a hundred thousand dollars. Oh my gosh, I would turn him in myself if I knew. And Booth kind of has fun with that. Oh, you would, you would turn him in, huh? And so it's kind of a, a running joke, right? So no one still doesn't suspect anything. That next day while they're playing out in the yard with Booth, John and William are there and this is the end of the war. So there are people kind of walking by the front of the house in the front gate there are people riding on horses. There's just people going back to their lives. And somebody comes through the front gate and starts walking down the path to the main house. And they notice Booth get nervous. And he asks Richard B. Garrett, the junior, the 11-year-old, to run up and grab his gun belt off the bedstand. And he does. 
and he brings that gun belt down and gives it to Booth. Booth swings it around his hips and, and buckles it up. And that is when they go, what is going on? Why does he want his gun belt? What is he afraid of? What he, does he think is going to happen? Like, when you really think about this, if he really has been through war, like John and William have claimed to have also been through war, they're not feeling afraid right now for their lives because war is over. We are all trying to get back to our lives right now. And we've all kind of put up the truce flag. So for him to be grabbing his gun belt leads them to believe he's wanted or afraid for another reason. And that is when John Garrett, the older son, starts to insist to his father, they shouldn't sleep in the house tonight. Something's up with these two. So it's the, it's the older son who brings that to his dad's attention. So that's how Booth ends up staying in the house the first night. And then like you, or like we find out, you know, here in just a bit, he ends up sleeping in the barn mm -hmm. the next night. So the big claim is Booth wants to get up early with Harold. They want to get on their way. And John insists they sleep in the tobacco barn because if they're going to get up early, they don't want him rousing the people in the house. And then John also has, he's nervous because the, there's children and women in the house. Absolutely. And Booth seems a little unhinged. And so he thinks it's better for them to get in the barn as well. But he also thinks they might steal my horses. And so he locks them in the tobacco barn. Oh. Unbeknownst to them. Okay. So in the miniseries, they try to, and I'll tell you what all is wrong with the miniseries at that point, but they are knowingly locked in the barn in the miniseries. That's not true. And they didn't know. So it's late that night into that. It's late that night on the 25th that the cavalry will catch up to the Garrett farm. They go straight to the main house. They take Richard H. Garrett, the father, out. They put a rope around his did, neck. Did they, I mean, did they find like the neighbor? They found Jet. They, so they found Jet. They yep. questioned him. Yep. He said, oh, he's at the Garrett farm. And that, so that's how they, they got over there. Okay. Yeah, they found Jet. So they, they had just been like canvassing the countryside. Yeah, yeah. And they were basically honing in. They found Jet. Mm -hmm. And then that's how they, had they zeroed in on the Garrett's. Jet was the key to everything. Okay. And Jet said, I left him at the Garrett farm. And so the cavalry, I think, is probably feeling they're not there. It's been two days. But they feel like this will be our next step. So when they get to the Garrett house, they pull Mr. Garrett out. And Mr. Garrett answers the door in his nightgown. They pull him out and, and they put a rope around his neck and they throw the rope up a tree threatening to kill him if he doesn't tell him what happened. Oh, wow. And that's when John Garrett stops everything and says, no, I put them in the tobacco barn. And they well, he said, I put him in the barn and they look around the four barns. You better tell us what barn. And he goes, it's the tobacco barn. And that's when they go over to the tobacco barn. So it really is like it happens fast and they're still not sure who this guy is. Like they're not saying we're looking for the Lincoln assassin. Yeah, leader. we're looking for John Wilkes Booth. Yeah. yeah, and so that's when and and the the scene around the barn is he kicks Harold out because Harold gets scared. Harold doesn't have a weapon. Harold doesn't want to fight. He kicks him out. John Wilkes Booth tries to negotiate for a a fight against their best man, right? And then they just kind of smoke him out. Well, Boston Corbett claims he was looking through a crack in the wood in the boards. He claims he saw John Wilkes Booth raise his pistol to fire it and he fires now harold will say he shot he shot john Wilkes Booth, who will never move again he shot through the neck he's not shot in the back of the head like they try to depict in the miniseries same as lincoln he shot through the neck it's a completely different gunshot wound than lincoln lincoln shot in the head through the brain lincoln's not paralyzed lincoln is just unconscious never regains consciousness booth is shot through the neck he's conscious the whole time he, he lives for hours, about six hours later, he'll, he'll die. But Harold is taken out, tied to a tree. He keeps whimpering. He keeps making up stories. He's, I wasn't a part of this. I didn't. He really is like a simple-minded man. Gotcha. And he really is trying to make up, I, I was bamboozled into this and I don't know who this is. He's and trying to get out of he's it. He's trying to get out of it, making any story he can. And they're just kind of letting him over there, run his mouth. And they bring Booth onto the porch Booth is attended by 
think of those young women in the house. There's four Garrett's sisters who are in their 20s and late teens. There's one governess. Well, in, in the book, too, in the excerpts that I was looking at, there are a couple paragraphs before mm-hmm. what, I, what I read in the book, talks about how pretty well known John Wilkes Booth was and how handsome he was. And and he was a bit of a ladies man. He was. And so that's why when these women kind of gather around him, they wipe his brow and they like put a handkerchief of of water in his mouth so he can have some moisture. And uh, it's Lucinda Holloway, who's the governess of those small children in the house, who it's very romanticized how she like holds his hands and holds him near to her. She cuts a lock of hair. Now this is after he's been shot. After he's been shot, okay. he's laying on the porch. Right. They try he's to make got him shot comfortable. Through the neck. He, he can't. He can't do move, anything. Yeah. Can't move. And they bring a doctor, and the doctor's like, yeah, he's gonna die. Like, and so they just make it like it's a very moving moment for these women, right? Still not knowing who he is. Oh, interesting. Just that he's this handsome person that the person. cavalry tracked down. And you have to remember John Wilkes Booth has shaved his mustache at this point. He shaves his mustache at Dr. Mudd's house. So even when people look at pictures, they the picture they're looking at, they're showing of Booth, that famous picture, people will look at it and go, yeah, that's him, but without the mustache. So they have to kind of like squint a little to go, yeah, that's him, but he's shaved his mustache. It's such a distinctive feature on his face that he's taken off that he does still look like him, but it's not quite the same. It'd be like Tom Selleck shaving his mustache. It'd be like, okay, that's him, but it's not not quite how I know him. You would go, yeah, that's Tom Selleck, but it's not quite how I yeah. picture him. Tom Selleck put that mustache back on. Exactly. So that's how Booth was. He's very known for the mustache. So he passes away there on the Garrett farm, and it's not until after his death that they fully understand the Garrett family, who this man is, because it's then that they start to get questioned by the people in charge there. And they start to go, we had no idea. We, we suspected something, but we weren't sure this is, oh my gosh, we've been giving refuge to Lincoln's assassin. We had, they had no idea. So they don't even know till after he's dead. And so then Booth's body's taken back to D.C. And, and we, we have more videos on what happens after that. So Richard Garrett, 11 years old, remembers all of this. And he, in the 1880s, will write a paper trying to, I, I wouldn't say clear his family name, but it's more explain his family name because he feels like for the rest of his life, his family will never recover from this. So he writes a paper really explaining how much they didn't know and how they were just trying to be good Christian people helping out somebody. And then they were completely blindsided by all of this. And they never would have given refuge to the president's killer. And and so he really explains his memory of it all. Because it's very much from an 11 year old child. So it's very much from a innocent mind. Yeah, this is how I felt. This was, you, know, you think about an, try, think about an 11 year old trying to destru- describe something to you, yeah. right? They're going to tell you kind of how it felt and how much fun it was. They're not going to remember details or cues that adults would pick up on exactly necessarily. Exactly. So that's the grave we visit. So when I found out that Richard B. Garrett was buried at Cedar Grove Cemetery in Portsmouth, Virginia, I'm like, we have to go. There. And that's only like 15 minutes from where we lived. And it's it's an amazing little cemetery. So it was established in 1832, very old. And it's it's historic. We didn't know this, but this is where Pickett from Pickett Char- Pickett's Charge was first buried. That's right. Before they moved him. Before they moved him to Hollywood Cemetery in, in Richmond. Richmond. Yeah. And then there's also like the the creator, I don't know if that's the right, the right word, the designer of the CSS Virginia, the first ironclad of the South is also buried there. And they have a whole little CSS Virginia dedication area where they have a bunch of confederates who served on the CSS Virginia. Yeah. And then we actually came across and and chatted for a while with um, some gentlemen who would help restore uh, the cemetery because I guess in the late nineties, and you mentioned this in the video, it had been in shambles. And then the, uh, the sons of the Confederacy came in and basically 
you know, overhauled and just prettied everything up. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine cemeteries get into a lot of disrepair and neglect. But in the 1960s, it was like more than that. It was vandalized. And so they came in and just cleaned everything up. And there was some, he was even saying there were some mausoleums that were kind of broken into and you could see inside of them and stuff. And they cleaned all that up and they fixed them. And it's very, it's, it's a lovely cemetery now. It is. And there's a lot of history there. And Garrett was one of them. And so to find Richard Garrett, that 11 year old boy, and to kind of talk about his memories of those last two days, the 24th, 25th, and 26th of April, 1865, and the hunt for John Wilkes Booth, it was just amazing to be able to do that. And I really was excited because I had read the book Manhunt. The series was coming out. I thought this is such a great piece of history to have found and to talk about. And then when I watched Manhunt, I'm like, oh, I'm so excited to see Richard Garrett. And he's not even shown. Yeah, you said they were the, the miniseries didn't portray the whole Garrett farm, Garrett family accurately at they all. They didn't do any. So it's so off. And if you're a historian, you're going to be pretty upset. There's a lot of things in the, the Manhunt miniseries that is, is way off. There's lots of things that are great. I think the man who plays John Wilkes Booth looks fantastic. But there's so many things that are way off. Let's start from the basics. Stanton, the Secretary of War, never leaves D.C. Yet he seems to be at the Garrett farm in the miniseries. Everywhere. He's yeah. he's questioning the Like, no, this is Garrett. Stanton stays in D.C. He runs things by telegraph. And they show that some in the series. But he's also a heavy set man. He also has a huge beard. Nothing like the actor who portrayed him. So that was kind of weird. At the Garrett farm, all they meet is Julia Garrett. She's supposed to play one of the daughters of the Garretts. Now, the hard part for me to kind of understand is you have many daughters to choose from. You got Catherine, you got Anne, you got Julia, you got, they're all in their 20s and uh, Julia's 15. You got Lucinda Holloway. That's the governess. She's 34. You got the three little girls, Lillian, Harrietta, and Cora. Wow. There's no Julia. There was a Julia Garrett. She was born in 1848. She dies in 1851. That's so interesting that when writers who are writing these shows, I mean, some of them do phenomenal jobs and they're very accurate, very close to, to real world facts. And then this one, it's such a famous event. I mean, it's, it's such a big part of American history. I think you and I were talking about it the other night. There's, there's really no need for them to alter the facts. You can, you can leave certain things out, right? But the, the facts themselves are so out of this world. I can't believe that actually happened. We've said it before, kind of reality is stranger than fiction here. I know. I don't understand. And I know James Swanson was there at some point, And I know he was given some advice. If it was me in my book, I'd be like, no, pick another name. Make it Lucinda Holloway. She has a, she has a very, she cuts the hair from Booth. Make it her. If you're going to make some girl there who's, I, I, it could destroy my honor if you stay in my room, make it her, right? Why would you make it a Julia Garrett who died at two years old in 1851? Like, why would you, that's not even accurate person. So, what they did is they took out all the men. There's no Richard H. Garrett. There's no John or William Garrett. There's no Richard B. Garrett. That's so interesting. There's no men interacting. It's like she is the only one at the house. They're all gone. She interacts with Booth and Harold. Then she insists they sleep in the tobacco farm because of her honor. If her father is going to find him in her bedroom. The, the crazy part is, is right. A, a series, a story is always about tension and, and this, that, and the other. And, in the real world facts are in my mind would create so much more tension in a, in a scene, especially for a series like this. Think about it's all about ups and downs in a story and think about this unexpected up in the hunt for John Wilkes Booth, right here. The first 24 hours, he's like having a grand old time and they're telling stories and this is big family and it's this event. And, and you as a watcher, as a reader, would just feel conflicted because you're like, oh, here's this nice thing that's happening, mm -hmm. right? 
the viewer knows the reality of who this person is. So there's that tension there. But they didn't they didn't use that in the miniseries. It's crazy to me. It's crazy. That dinner scene would have been amazing. It would have been amazing. To show 12 people and after the war and what it was like to kind of be on the losing side, but trying to rebuild family and everyone kind of, but then starting those little pieces that are picking away at his story, right? So much so that the next day they go, you should sleep in the barn. So the first night we we welcome you with open arms. You're given a bed. You're you're sitting around dinner. We're having a great time, and so much so that your story gets picked away the next day that you're in the barn. That's that's perfect movie drama cinema. I don't know why they did it that way. It really it bothered me so much because I we had just found Richard B. Garrett. We had just told his story. He's so much a part of this end of a manhunt. And then he's not even shown in the miniseries. I was like, oh, my gosh, they really missed the mark. And that really is what happens after the booth is caught and, and taken back to D.C. I mean, Richard H. Garrett, the father, will testify at the Lincoln conspiracy trial about everything that he remembers and how he was he felt completely bamboozled. Now, he's not charged with anything. He's not sentenced to anything. So I think his story is very credible, credible and believable. What happens is the, the court of public opinion where he lives in Locust Hill, it, he's never welcomed back into the community. Yeah. His name, his name and his family's name is kind of ruined. It's ruined. Their family is ruined. They can't really do business anymore. The house and the property will go into a disrepair. And you said that Richard B. Garrett Jr., the son, he actually becomes a pastor, like a preacher. Yeah, he becomes a reverend. He actually has a, a parish and they will they put something on his tombstone from 1899 to 1920. He becomes a reverend. So in the Richmond area, he actually dies in Richmond, Virginia. So it's funny. He dies in Richmond, spread to Norfolk. Pickett dies in Norfolk, spread to Richmond. And you talk about this a lot. Like <laughs> back in that day, they really liked to move the dead. Around. Yeah, I think I, I commented on that when you told me about them them moving Pickett. I was like, man, they would move the dead around all the time back in the day. They'd bury him over here and be like, nah, 10 years later, I'm going to move him up to this plot. It's I know. Crazy. It's weird. I don't know. Maybe they like to look at dead, but I don't know. It's very weird They to do that. But that's... He's buried alone. So there's no other real Garrett's around him. I think his wife is beside him, but there's no Garrett's around him. All the, the rest of the Garrett's are all in another part of Virginia. Now, what's interesting, and I point this out in one of the videos, is he's buried beside a, a Corbett family. Yeah. And remember, it's Boston Corbett who kills John Wilkes Booth. So the Garrett grave, Richard B. Garrett, is right beside this whole Corbett plot. This whole Corbett plot. So it's like these two names that are synonymous with the end of John Wilkes Booth are actually buried together. Yeah, but you you said that from what you could tell your your brief research that that wasn't those Corbetts weren't related to Boston Corbett. Yeah, and I, I don't believe they are. And the thing about Boston Corbett is we have never done a video on him, and it would be interesting. He's very interesting person, interesting life. So much so that people don't even know what happened to him at the end of his life. He kind of got lost to history. People don't really know where his grave is today. And we don't even know if Boston Corbett was really his name. Oh, interesting. So it's one of those things that is, is if someone wanted to dive into that research and really pull that out, like he is one of those people in history that did something very significant, but never, never fully researched to know the truth. It's his pistol, too. I think it's Swanson had said one of those artifacts lost to history no one knows what really happened to the Boston Corbett pistol that killed John Wilkes Booth. I, w I would still recommend the miniseries. It's well done, even if not historically accurate. But the book itself, the Manhunt book, was supposed to be very, very good. Oh. The book is fantastic. And if you find it on audio, I listened to it. It was available through my library for free. I actually bought the book at the Surratt Tavern. So that is still there for you to go look. Remember, John Wilkes Booth never goes inside because he's on his horse with the broken leg, but Harold does to get the rifle and the field glasses. But it, the Surratt Tavern is still there part of the story. If you want to follow that path 
of John Wilkes Booth's escape. That's all still there for you. We have some videos. So actually someone commented that they're doing like a John Wilkes Booth like escape tour on on the video. They actually commented that they were going to be doing that. So it was pretty cool. All right, history buffs, that's it for this episode. We followed the frantic escape of John Wilkes Booth and David Harold all the way to the Garrett farm. A desperate fugitive holed up in a barn, a nation in mourning, and a fiery end to an infamous manhunt. It's a chilling tableau. For those who want to dig deeper, check out the show notes for some great resources. James Swanson's book, Manhunt, is a fantastic read, as we mentioned before. As always, if you have any thoughts or questions about the episodes, reach out to us at the email in our show notes. Just click the link and shoot us a note. Your feedback really fuels the fire for us. And as always, we rely on you, our community, to grow. And we appreciate you all every day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. That's how we'll talk about all those things. We are going to have to put some stuff on the walls in this room oh yeah i think i might bring the it's a wonderful life picture up well no i'm talking about for sound i can hear oh, the echo what do you mean like that what goes on the wall it's probably more like corners you can do you don't have to buy things for that you can you can do there's tons of like homemade solutions that'll reduce the echo in a room so this will look um, really hodgepodge no no we can we can make it look look good okay i mean you can buy stuff i don't know i haven't really dug into that i know but i can hear the echo in here oh especially when you we start both start projecting okay that's fine we'll figure it out so okay ready ready